world around us. We, we were able to see and establish that. And everything that we believe about God makes all the difference in the world. It impacts every aspect of our lives. And because of this, we spent, you know, the first week talking about how we can develop a desire to know God more. And then we spent the next six weeks taking a look at different attributes of God. And what we've learned so far has been very powerful. We learned, for example, that God is good, right? God is good. God always has our best interests in mind. He will never do anything that is wrong or, or bad if you will, or evil. He can be totally trusted to do what's in our best interests. Always. We also learned that God is sovereign, right? God reigns over all. He reigns over the entire universe. He is all-powerful. There is nothing outside his ability to influence a situation, to, to change it, to make a positive difference, to turn it on its head. God reigns over all. He is sovereign. We also learn that God is holy. And what we learned is that it is more than just God having moral perfection, but it's that God is set apart from all of creation and perfect in all of his attributes. He is wholly other. We also learn that God is wise. God is all-knowing. There's nothing beyond his intellect or his ability to resolve whatever we may face. Nothing catches God off guard. We say, oh, I didn't see that one coming. God is all-knowing and all wise. And we also learn that God is just. God is fair. He does not show favoritism, and he can be counted on to always do what's right. These are powerful truths that we have learned. And, and, and during the messages, we've also picked up on other truths about God uh, along the way, such as the fact that God's character qualities never change. God doesn't change. As it says in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from whom? The Father of heavenly lights, who what? Does not change like shifting shadows. What's saying here is like, as I walk on the stage, you can see my shadow and then it just moves. And with a change in light of things, the shadows can shift at any moment. They can change at, at any point in time. And, and it's saying God is the total opposite of that. God is not like that. He does not change. He is consistent and perfect. Doesn't change. God can be trusted to always act in accordance with his nature. And last week we learned that God is loving. Right? We learned that God is loving. Uh, behind all that God does is love. Love, Antonio uh, shared, is the highest motivation that God has. Right? It's God's highest motivation in all the ways that God acts towards us and all the things that God does behind it all is love. And now, for the final week of the series, we are taking a look at God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. In addition to all we've learned about God so far, another fact of his character is that he is faithful. And we see this in a number of different passages. We see it in Lamentations uh, 3, for example, where it says, because of the Lord's great love, right, which we've just learned about, we are not consumed, right? God's holiness and his love. He says, you know, if, if, because we are sinful people, he would be just to just take us all out. But he doesn't. We're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Right? Maybe a little song is coming to your mind at this point. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Right? Thy compassions, they fail not. Great is your faithfulness. In Psalm 33, verse 4, we, he, we see that it says, For the word of the Lord is right and true, and he is what? Faithful in all that he does. We see it in Psalm 100, verse 5, which says, For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues for all generations. What you see here, even in this one verse, is this interplay between all his attributes. Every single one works in conjunction with the other. None works apart or separate from the other. God is perfect in, in his nature. They all work consistently. He doesn't change. And you see this interplay even here. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful. And he who called you into his fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who we sang about 
and who we love. And it also says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Over and over, we see the Bible telling us that God is faithful. And what this tells us is that God is what? He's dependable. He's loyal. God can be trusted to keep his promises. God can be trusted to come through for us. And this is an all-important trait uh, because all of us appreciate someone who can be counted on, right? Someone who can be counted on and doesn't just bail out on you when the going gets tough. None of us like that. You know, for me, uh, I don't know if it's because of my upbringing, uh, being part of dying, whatever, but loyalty is very important to me, okay? I, I really uh, value those who are loyal. It's, it's, it's high on my list. Um, I'm passionate about hopefully being someone who will be there through thick and thin, who doesn't cut and run, and I really value that in others. Because when you get down into the trenches of living life and doing things, you want to know that someone's going to be there. And so I really appreciate those who are that way. You know, it's becoming a rare trait these days for people to be uh, totally committed. But it's essential. If we're going to accomplish anything of significance in life and for God and His kingdom, we need to depend upon Him. We need to be loyal to God, and we need to be loyal to one another. I love those who are faithful. And, and I'm sure all of you can appreciate someone who uh, can be trusted to be there for you and, and always will. You know, maybe you know someone in your life who's been that way. And I'm sure we can especially appreciate the fact that God is this way. God will always be there. And what did Jesus promise? And lo, I will be with you always till the very end of the age. He basically said, when I send you out, no, I am faithful to you. So God is faithful, and this is a very important quality. And yet, as much as we may value faithfulness and see this, someone could wonder why we're ending the message series on this attribute of God. I don't know if that, that struck you at all. You know, but why would we end there? Why wouldn't we end on God's love, for example, right? Uh, and with the fact that God is loving, especially since, you know, as Antonio pointed out last week, love is the driving force behind all that God does, right? Think about how important love is to the nature of God. Not only that, but love sums up all Scripture, does it not? Jesus told us, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. <clears throat> love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments, saying really, the, everything that we learn in the Bible, the entire Bible, can be summed up in these two things. Love God and love your neighbor, basically. That's how important love is. Not only that, but love is such a part of God's character that it's even synonymous with God. Look at this, as it says in 1 John 4. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because what? God is love. And that is just not some, you know, 70s, you know, peace, God is love, man. You know, it's, no, this is such a part of his nature. Such a profound aspect. It is that driving force. It is everything. Love, it can be asserted, is the most important attribute of God. And so why end with faithfulness? Why end with faithfulness? Well, as many of you know, uh, when we came into the series, I, you know, we've shared that uh, we were correlating this series to uh, a resource that was put out by the founding pastor uh, of the church, Chick Ingram, uh, called The Real God. And we kind of used the same graphics, and we have our small groups going through his teachings on this, and it was a great thing, kind of a church-wide campaign. And so we did that. And, and one reality was that uh, this was simply the order of the attributes that Chip laid out, and we just kind of went with it, Okay. So you can say, well, that doesn't sound all that spiritual. <laughs> but it's the truth. That's what we did. So really when I was thinking about, maybe Chip had a reason behind ending with faithfulness and not love. And I looked into it. And even though he doesn't come right out and mention it, uh, based upon his book, I would say that he chose to do this because he wanted to leave off on a message of hope. Okay? Wanted to leave off on a message of hope. 
And the reason I say this is because when it comes to God's faithfulness, this is what he wrote in the last chapter of a book that he wrote on this. He said this, God's faithfulness offers hope for every person, no matter what's going on in your life and how bad it might be right now. Stress, health problems, financial problems, marital problems, problems with your children, loneliness, desperately wanting to be married, desperately wishing you weren't, okay, <laughs> or any other issue you may have. He says, wherever you are and whatever pain you're in, God's loving compassion towards you will never, ever end. He says, if you're feeling helpless and hopeless, the answer is faithfulness. Okay. So ending with hope would really be a good reason to end with the last character quality of God that we focus on being his faithfulness. And here's the thing. Just over a week ago, God brought to my mind what could be uh, the most powerful reason why it's essential um, to end the series on this trait. And it has to do with hope, but it really focuses it in, a, in even more. Um, the week before uh, we focused on God's love, that was a very interesting week for me. Okay? Um, Starting on Wednesday of that week, I, I ended up developing a very debilitating, um, let's just say, headache. Uh, and uh, I scheduled an appointment with my doctor on that Friday. And, and uh, so then Thursday came around, and it, it just got much, much worse. I was, getting, I was lightheaded. I was nauseous. The pain was just, it was, ne it was like a headache I'd never had before. Um, I was thinking, you know, I want to get to the doctor, but that's not till Friday. Maybe she also, you know, I got urged to go to urgent care, and I did, and I got some, you know, some prescriptions for some uh, medication and stuff, and then, and, and I thought that would help, and then Friday came along, and I was like, okay, I'll get up and go to the doctor and just see what's going on, and it, it got even worse. I could barely even uh, function and move. I had to be, you know, driven the first time to urgent care, and then I had to be driven by my, by my son to the, the doctor's appointment. Anytime I walked out into the, I couldn't even look at the sun. I couldn't do anything. It was just, it was just a, a really powerful uh, thing that was going on. And, and, and it got even worse. And as I went to my primary doctor, when I described all of my symptoms that was going on, uh, she said that we need to keep close watch uh, because what I could be experiencing was a brain aneurysm. Brain aneurysm. And she said, so just monitor the situation. <laughs> what? And if it gets any worse, even a little bit worse, <clears throat> go directly to the emergency room. <clears throat> so on Saturday, I felt slightly better, but I wasn't sure if it was because of the medication I was on, if it was masking these symptoms of a more serious situation, which it could be, or uh, if it was helping and I was getting better. It was hard. So went to urgent care again, and the doctor there said that very thing. Yeah, he said it could be masking it. You need to go to the ER. So Kelly and I, we went, and we prayed, and we uh, got in there, and I, and I, I had to go get a, a CT scan. And thankfully, the CT scan showed that there wasn't uh, an aneurysm. Thankfully, we're, we're, uh, uh, everything was fine, and that, according to them, it must have been just an intensely severe migraine, but it also could be that God just chose to remove whatever was going on because we believe in the power of prayer, do we not? Amen. So I'm very thankful for that. I'm also glad that they found there was a brain there. So, uh, you know... <laughs> But here's the thing. What's crazy is that as I monitored my situation <laughs> and looked up the symptoms of a brain aneurysm, here's what I found, and I want to show this to you. There were 10 symptoms of a brain aneurysm. The first was severe headache. And they say it's often described as the most uh, intense headache that you've ever had. Check. They said, well, you're having vision problems. Yes, things were blurry. I'd be looking at TV and I'd be like, everything go blurry and fuzzy. Uh, you know, it was hard to kind of keep focus at things and stuff like that. And I was like, vision problems? And as they described them, check. Nausea or vomiting. Thankfully, I wasn't throwing up, but I was still nauseous. But when I went to urgent care, they also gave me this medicine that would keep you from getting totally nauseous. So it was <clears throat> reducing it, but it was still all there. So I'm like, nausea? Check. 
going through it. Dennis said neck stiffness. Now, you know, I've had neck stiffness before. We all deal with that. But it was like really intense in this one spot. It was just not going away. And that, and that was one of those things that it said you have. So it was like another one. Check. Facial tingling. Had that. I've been have, experiencing numbness on the side of my face. We think it's due to allergies. And I think that is what it is looking back now. But I was having that. But you wonder, was it something that was just, you know, always there and it's been another issue? Or is it that it was a symptom that was occurring early on before these other ones became an onset? So it's like, is it? All right. Check that box too. Fatigue. You may not gather this, but I'm kind of a high energy person, right? And uh, I have energy, and, and oftentimes it's, it's not really even without coffee. I don't drink coffee much. I start a little bit, now I'm off it. You know, I don't like coffee. And, uh, but fatigue, I was fatigued. I was more tired than normal. And, okay, yes, and it, I talk fast normally. Okay, you guys have to know that by now. I, no caffeine, none this morning. But I had this fatigue. Photophobia, aversion to light, not even want to be in it. You know, it, it really hurts. Check. Then it goes down to the last three. There was trouble speaking. <laughs> you know that didn't happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> Me, pastor, no. Yeah, you know, no trouble speaking here. Seizures? Didn't have that. That would be a pretty, pretty clear thing. And loss of consciousness? No, I didn't pass out or anything else. So, but apart from that, I had seven out of the ten symptoms. The only ones where I was lacking were those really more serious you know, ones, if you will, the v- more vivid ones. So this definitely captures your attention, especially when your doctor says, you need to monitor this, and if it gets any worse, go directly to the ER. I can't help you. And when you hear news like this, it can cause you to wonder, honestly, how much longer do I have here on this earth? It really does. From Friday to Saturday, I said, did you get good sleep? As best as I could. But you wonder, am I going to be here? Will you wake up in the morning? What's going to happen? And here's where God's faithfulness comes into play the most. When you have moments, when you face your own mortality, and you have, you've placed your faith in Jesus, what you really want to know is, will God come through and save me as he has promised? Let's get real. That's where the rubber meets the road. Yes, God is good. Oh yeah, God is so good. And yes, he is sovereign. And yes, he is holy and wise and just. And he has the power to save. And he's made it possible. And he's given that promise. But what you really need to know is, is he going to come through? Is he going to follow through? Or, is he gonna, or could it be, where, oh, yes, I can do this, but mm, I'm not going to do this in this case. Will he do it? And this is where passages such as 1 John 1, 9 really take on even more significance. It says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we ask God to forgive us, to save us, He does so. Why? Say it. Because God is faithful. When we place our faith in Jesus, we have a place in heaven that's guaranteed. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, and you were also included in Christ when you heard uh, the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It says, when you believed, or upon having believed, the, 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 the original language there says, in that moment, in that instant that you believe, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, guaranteeing our place in heaven. And why is this the case? Why do, can we know this? Because why? God is faithful. And why can we be convinced, as it says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, neither powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love is everything. God is love, and he loves us more than we can even imagine. But how can we know that we won't be separated from that love? 
Because God is what? Faithful. Faithfulness. Maybe that's why it should go last. So important. God is all that we have learned and so much more. And yet, we could never have true peace. We could never have hope. We could never have joy if he wasn't faithful. But God is faithful. He's faithful to me. He's faithful to you. When we put our faith, trust in he is faithful. He can be counted on. And because of this, we're to do, as it says in the book of Hebrews, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God is faithful and he will save us. He can be counted on to follow through on his promise. And when we are, you know, we are to stand firm on this, especially when life gets difficult and especially when we face the possibility of entering eternity. And here's a reality that most of us don't like to think about, but it's all too true. We don't know how much time we have here on earth. None of us knows how much time we have. We hope to live long lives. But you never know. You can't know. It can all be over in an instant. It could be a car accident or an aneurysm. It could be cancer or a criminal. It could be whatever. Your life could be taken in an instant. We don't know how much time we have. We can't presume upon tomorrow. None of us can know when our time may come, but the good news is that we can know where we're going whenever that time comes. See, the Bible teaches us that we can know, know that we have eternal life. Not just hope. Not just think it might be a good thing. Not just have a good chance. But we can know that we have eternal life. In 1 John 5, 13, it says this, I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that what? You may know you have eternal life. And the way we know this is simple. If we ask God to forgive us, and we entrust our lives to Jesus, and choose to follow Him, the Bible says that we can know we're going to heaven when our time comes. It's guaranteed. The Bible's clear. All of us, sin and fall short of the glory of God, as it says in the book of Romans, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. And that's a very serious thing because we all have not just a sin nature, but we all choose to sin. And that sin separates us from God, the Bible says. And sin will keep us from going to heaven. And we can spend eternity separated from God and spending eternity in a place that is called hell. Eternal separation from God, weeping and gnashing of teeth is described, anguish, total regret, always no one wants that. And that's what our sin will take us to. But here's the thing. God took care of it all. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we are still yet sinners, while we are still enemies of God, while we are still destined for hell, and justifiably so, Jesus died for us. And so even though, as it says in Romans 6, 23, for the wage of the sin is death, and we're not just talking about physical death here. It's talking about spiritual death, eternal separation from God. Even though the wages of sin is death, and that's what everybody just, just, justifiably would receive, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sin. He paid the penalty for your sin, my sin, everyone's sin. And he says he made it possible for all of us to have eternal life, to receive the gifts. All we have to do is ask for his forgiveness. Follow Jesus. Be willing to learn how he wants us to live our lives and try our best to do that. And he says, just try. No one's going to be perfect this side of heaven. If you claim to be, if you say you got reached a point of sinlessness, you lie, the Bible says. The truth is not in you. But we have eternal life. And, then, and so how does that all happen? Well, you go to Romans 10, it says this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning He's Lord. He's the one I need to follow. He's the one I need to take my marching orders from. He sits on the throne in my heart. He's the one who I say, if I have to know what to do, he makes that decision. I follow what he says. 
and you believe in your heart that God <clears throat> raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe, you make that decision, right? Heart, with your mind and most everything, you make that decision, you believe, and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. It says that scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Why? Come on. Because he is faithful. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all. He is just. He is fair. And he is faithful. And it says, the Lord is over all and richly blesses all who call on him. For why? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Every person can know that they're going to heaven. You here this morning, if you haven't made that commitment, you can know that you are going to heaven. If you're watching by night, you can know that you're going to heaven. You can be forgiven and have a place in heaven for all eternity. The Bible makes it clear. All you need to do is call on the name of Jesus. And what this means, again, is first that a person asks Jesus to forgive them of their sin. You don't try and be a good enough person. You don't try and do all that stuff. You don't try and go on your own righteousness, your own good behavior. But you say, Jesus, I'm turning away from that and I'm turning towards you. This is why in Luke chapter 5 we see this. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, those who, have, you know, <laughs> don't see us having any need for God. But he says, but sinners to repentance. That's what repentance refers to. It refers to a turning away from sin and a turning towards God, saying, I ask you, forgive me, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to trust what you did on the cross for me. Next, it entails believing that Jesus is the Son of God who rose from the grave, as we, ju as we just read in Romans 10, trusting in his payment for sin on the cross for us. And then we see in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because it says it is for for it is by grace that we have been saved, right? Through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. See, it says there that salvation is a gift. Not by works so no one can boast. No one's going to say, hey, I was good enough. I got here. I did a number of good things. I lived a good life. Or so, let's just say they're a little bit more humble. Oh, at least I was at least 51% good and 49% bad. I made the cut. I'm in. That's not how it works. None of us can be. We can never make the standard. The standard is perfection. We can do it. Only Christ did that. We can't make that. So it's not by works. No one's going to be boasting. It's a gift from God. What is a gift? A gift is something that is freely offered. He says, if you confess, you trust, you believe, you're willing to follow me, he offers this as a gift, and all you have to do is receive a gift. You don't work for it. And finally, this commitment, this calling upon the name of the Lord, acknowledging that he is Lord, means that we're willing to learn how, as I shared, he wants us to live our lives and strive to live that way. Because Jesus said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. And when he says, who wants to be my disciple, he's not saying, if you want to be a real serious Christian, then you'll do this. No. Disciple was synonymous with follow, which is synonymous with believer, which is synonymous with anyone who wants to be in heaven, not hell. Anyone who wants to commit their lives to him. That's what it's referring to there. And he says you must be willing to do that. And what's so exciting is that we can do this. We can make this commitment in a moment. We can do this. If our hearts are right, we just want to do this. All it takes is a moment of time in prayer and talking to God and committing this, making this commitment to God through prayer. All it takes is expressing something to God along these lines. We'll, we'll show it up on screen. You just say something to the effect that, God, thank you for what you've done for me. You say, I, you know, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins instead of me. You know, I, I believe that you rose again to give me everlasting life. Please forgive me for the wrong things I've done, you know. Please give me a new start and a, and a, and a clean heart. I invite you into my life. Teach me to do everything you want me to do. And I'm willing to follow you all the days of my life. And say, I just pray this, believing in what Jesus did for me. See, here's the thing. It's not these exact words, but it's what all th that expresses. It expresses the heart. If you say, I believe all that, I can't necessarily say it, but God, save me. I believe in you. I'm trusting you. Save me. That's what it takes. For anyone sitting here this morning, anyone watching by the internet. So this morning, 
You know, I want to take our remaining moments together to provide anyone who is here, anyone who is watching, an opportunity to commit their lives to Jesus. To receive the gift of salvation that God longs to give to you. God wants you to know where you are going when you die. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. He doesn't want you to have a question about it. He wants you to have the peace of knowing that you have heaven waiting for you whenever your time may come. He wants you to live with the joy and the excitement of knowing that no matter what happens in this life, you have eternal life. And so right now I want to do something important. If you've never made this kind of commitment to God, or if you're unsure, you think, I may have, but I don't know if I really have. I don't know if I was sincere. I, maybe I was young at the time and I wasn't. I, I don't know if I really meant it. Maybe I was just following along with some friends. Maybe to, Whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. If you are unsure or you know, no, I've never made this kind of commitment, I want to give you the opportunity to make that commitment this morning. I want you to express that prayer that you see on the screen to God. I will lead in this prayer out loud to kind of give you the words. And, 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 and I want to have you express it to God. For you believe in your heart, but with your mouth you express your faith. You can express it silently where you are, just, Lord, as we pray the prayer. Or you can say it out loud, however you want to do it. But I want you to express that to God when we, I lead you in this. And if you're watching by the internet, whether it's live feed or you're watching this, even recorded, God hears this prayer and he will save you. However you do it, all that's required is that you mean it. And if you say, I, I'm not sure, just pray out of faith. Here's the thing you say, I, I, I think I believe, but, but, maybe, but, but, but you know what you need to pray? Then go ahead, help you in your unbelief. Jesus encountered a a soldier who said, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. You can have faith as small as a mustard seed. If you just have that little kind of say, I, I do believe, I, I struggle, I have questions, I have things, that's all okay. I don't know what happens in these situations. I, I, I have so many questions, but do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you believe that he paid the penalty for your sin and that you can't trust in anything else except what he did for you and you're willing to follow him? If you know that, that's your kernel, that's your mustard seed, that's all you need, and that's what all you need to pray. If you have that faith, let's pray right now. Let's, if we bow our heads and close our eyes, and if you're uh, uh, watching via the internet as well, just take this moment right now and pray. Just say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins instead of me. I believe Jesus rose again to give me eternal life. Please forgive me for the wrong things I've done. Forgive me for my sins. Please give me a new start and a clean heart. I invite you into my life. Teach me to do everything you want me to do, and I'm willing to follow you all the days of my life. I pray this believing in what Jesus did for me. Amen. You know, the Bible has a, a great news from you, the passage you've seen, it says, when you pray that prayer, in the moment you believe, we saw that, right? Upon having believed in Ephesians 1, in that instant, you're marking him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Some of you may have experienced a, a, a lifting of a burden. Some, you know, when you're sitting home, you say, I just feel lighter. I feel good. That's great. If you, I say, I don't really feel any different. But God is there because he is faithful. And the Bible says that angels are rejoicing in heaven. They are throwing a party right now in heaven because even if one person prays that prayer, there's rejoicing in heaven. And so that is the most important thing. And that is enough. But I have a request this morning. If you made that commitment for the first time this morning, whether you're sitting here or whether you're watching via the internet, I just want you to ask you to do something important. I want you to, in a moment, when I ask you to, to just stand and then I also want you to email us at the church and let us know of your commitment. 
and say, why am I doing this? Is this trying to put a hoop or something? No. There's, a, there's an important reason why. Look what Jesus said as we see it recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now this may seem like a harsh statement, but it's actually a very loving statement. Because remember, everything is motivated by God's love. He doesn't want you to have any doubt. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. He wants you to, to be able to affirm the sincerity of your commitment and be willing to take that stand because you know, if, like I said, you know, if I meant it, then you have the joy. and you, you would be willing to say, I'm going to stand. I don't mind. Who knows? Who cares? I'm his. It's an opportunity to affirm the sincerity, boost your assurance, and it's a way to also receive encouragement to grow in your faith so that we can know and we can come alongside you and help you. So if you're here this morning, or if you, even if you're at home, you say, no one's going to see me. There's no one around. I'm in my living room by myself. What, why, why would I do this? It's for you. It's meant to be a gift for you. If that's where you just simply stand, we'll pray for you, and we'll do this. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and let's pray right now. For those here and those watching by the end. Lord, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you that at any moment, if we're unsure or we know we never did, Lord, when, as soon as we say that prayer, we have the smallest amount of faith, we meant that from our heart, Lord, you come in and you save us. And we thank you. We pray just over all these individuals, Lord, whether it's even now in this moment or they even watch a day from now, five days from now, months from now, Lord, whatever they see this, at any moment when they pray that prayer, you are faithful and you save. And we rejoice. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As it says in the book of Romans, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And that's because they have a place in heaven that's guaranteed. And why? Come on, say it with me. Because he is faithful. And I can think of no better way to end this series and end this time together by expressing this to him even more and singing of his faithfulness. I think most of you know the words. Let's sing it together.